Our modern society is heavily dependent on the use of rubber, both natural and synthetic. Products made from rubber are widely used everywhere. You can find numerous rubber products in your home, at work, and even in different modes of transportation, including cars, bikes, trains, aircraft, ships, and even the shoes you walk in. Similarly, the industrial sector uses rubber to make hoses, gaskets, and belts. All these products are made from natural or synthetic rubber. Synthetic rubber is mainly polymers synthesized from the byproducts of petroleum. About 15 billion kilograms, equivalent to 33 billion pounds, of various rubbers are produced annually, and of that amount, two-thirds are synthetic and are expected to generate global revenues of approximately 56 billion US dollars in 2020. Natural rubber is a type of polymer that is extracted from the sap of the rubber tree. After collecting this sap, it is exposed to mild heat and air. This process gives us natural rubber, which is very hard, but it gets soft and elastic once it is vulcanized by heating it with sulfur. On the other hand, synthetic rubber is an artificial elastomer, also known as a polymer, produced in factories using various catalysts in the process. Rubber produced in factories is made to have properties which meet the requirements of the industries they will be used in. Its elasticity, toughness and flexibility is best for making products that are used in transportation, consumer products, industrial products and in the medical sector. The advantages of using a synthetic rubber in modern industries stems from its incomparable resistance to weathering. Synthetic rubber is resistant to solvents, oxygen, oils and certain other chemicals. Also, synthetic rubber doesn't lose its flexibility when exposed to a wide range of temperatures. The transportation industry is the biggest user of both natural or synthetic rubber to manufacture tires. However, it's mixed with a filler agent like carbon black to make sturdy and tough tires. A slightly harder, more durable and less elastic quality of rubber is used extensively for making aircraft tires. The construction industry uses rubber in elevator belts, hoses, tubes, seismic bearings and a host of other applications. Industries that make consumer goods use rubber to make footwear, erasers, sporting goods, adhesives, latex gloves, floor mats, garden hoses and the list goes on. The healthcare sector makes up more than 10% of the gross domestic product of most developed countries and uses rubber in making surgical gloves, contraceptives and catheters. A number of devices within the medical industry rely on rubber and would be unable to operate effectively without its existence. Rubber's unique properties make it ideal for medical tubing, used on a widespread level as a sanitary means of transferring fluids, including blood. Rubber's flexibility also makes it the number one choice for key hospital products, such as leg straps which are used to attach fluid bags to the patient's body. Crucial for the manufacture of gloves used by medical staff in all facilities, it is also used to make components for needles used for injections, as well as caps and stoppers. Even the wheels and casters on hospital beds and trolleys are part made from rubber. Because rubber is so common and so unobtrusive, you probably don't give it a second glance. This would be a mistake. Rubber has played a large yet hidden role in global political and environmental history for more than 150 years. You want an industrial revolution? Then you are going to need three raw materials. Iron to make steel to make the machinery, fossil fuels to power that machinery, and rubber to connect and protect all the moving parts. Try running an automobile without a fan belt or a radiator hose. 
Very bad things will happen within a minute. Having enough steel and coal to build and run industrial machinery means nothing if the engines fry because you couldn't cool them. After the war, Caltech researchers began to investigate the use of synthetic rubbers to replace asphalt in their solid fuel rocket motors. By the mid-1950s, large missiles were being built using solid fuels based on synthetic rubber mixed with ammonium perchlorate and high proportions of aluminium powder. Such solid fuels could be cast into large, uniform blocks that had no cracks or other defects that would cause non-uniform burning. Ultimately, all large solid fuel military and civilian rockets and missiles would use synthetic rubber-based solid fuels, and they would play a significant part in the civilian space effort. Synthetic rubber is used a great deal in printing on textiles, in which case it is called rubber paste. By the 1960s, most chewing gum companies had switched from using chicle to butadiene-based synthetic rubber, which was cheaper to manufacture. But we must never forget that this wonder material we call synthetic rubber, which is so deeply ingrained into our modern civilization, is a war-born material that became one of the most important creations of man when the progress of modern civilization was still dependent on the volatility of global natural rubber supply. In 1906, worldwide natural rubber output was 60,000 tons, already an inadequate amount for the rising demand created by the burgeoning automobile industry. In 1909, Fritz Hoffmann, chief chemist in the Bayer Pharmaceutical Division, presented the first sample of synthetically produced polyisoprene. The isoprene rubber, however, had limited durability. Because of that, Bayer turned its attention to the production of a cheaper methyl rubber in 1910. War was the catalyst for sparking the interest in synthetic rubber. Mechanized warfare requires lots of rubber hoses, belts, gaskets, tires, etc. for tanks, airplanes, and such. In World War I, British naval blockades kept Germany from getting natural rubber from Southeast Asia. Through the 1920s, synthetic rubber research was influenced by the fluctuations of the price of natural rubber. Prices were generally low, but export restrictions of natural rubber from British Malaya, introduced by Britain in 1922, coupled with the resultant price increase, sparked the establishment of modest synthetic rubber research programs in the Soviet Union, Germany, and the United States between 1925 and 1932. The U.S. was also looking to develop synthetic rubbers, as by 1925 the country was consuming about 76% of the global rubber supply. The 1930s saw booming new synthetic rubber development and production worldwide. When the United States entered into World War II, there was enormous need for rubber. The U.S. government set goals for rubber consumption that were way too ambitious and that exceeded the rate of natural rubber that was being produced. Rubber was used to make an incredible amount of things that were made for the war. Rubber was wrapped around every inch of military wiring used in the war. Sherman tanks were made with half a ton of rubber, and some battleships contained 20,000 rubber parts. These were just a few examples of how much rubber was needed. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese seized most of the rubber plantations in Southeast Asia. This was a huge blow to the Allies' rubber supplies. 90 to 95 percent of the world's rubber supplies were grown within 15 degrees of Singapore. This was one of the first places that the Japanese conquered. This basically cut the U.S. and Allies off from the very important commodity that was necessary for the Allies who wanted to win the war. 
President Franklin D. Roosevelt was well aware of U.S. vulnerability because of its dependence on threatened supplies of natural rubber, and in June 1940, he formed the Rubber Reserve Company, RRC. The RRC set objectives for stockpiling rubber, conserving the use of rubber in tires by setting speed limits, and collecting scrap rubber for reclamation. After the loss of the natural rubber supply, the RRC called for an annual production of 400,000 tons of general-purpose synthetic rubber to be manufactured by four large rubber companies. On December 19, 1941, Jersey Standard, Firestone, Goodrich and Goodyear and United States Rubber Company signed a patent and information sharing agreement under the auspices of the RRC. The situation became even more critical as the need for rubber for the war effort increased. With the stocks of rubber dwindling and conflicts arising over the best technical direction to follow, Roosevelt appointed a rubber survey committee in August 1942 to investigate and make recommendations to solve the crisis. The committee, headed by financier Bernard M. Baruch, also included scientists James B. Conant, president of Harvard University, and Carl T. Compton, president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In the remarkably short time of one month, Baruch's committee made its recommendations, two of which were critical to solving the rubber crisis. First, the appointment of a rubber director who would have complete authority on the supply and the use of rubber, and the immediate construction and operation of 51 plants to produce the monomers and polymers needed for the manufacture of synthetic rubber. William M. Jeffers, president of the Union Pacific Railroad, served as the first rubber director, with Bradley Dewey, president of Dewey and Almy, as deputy, Several plants were scattered across the country, some for polymerization, others for the production of the monomers. The initial plants were built and brought on stream in a record time of nine months. By 1945, the United States was producing about 920,000 tons of synthetic rubber per year. So the next time you have the tires replaced on your car, or put on a pair of running shoes, or even watch a doctor or nurse slip on a pair of latex surgical gloves. Take a moment to remember the estimated 70 million servicemen and women on both sides of World War II who went to war in jeeps, trucks, ships, and airplanes, or those who marched into battle in rubber-soled boots. And the estimated 45 to 60 million people military and civilian, who lost their lives in the conflict. These were the people who suffered the pain of progress.